blue. Thank you, thank you. Well, a, a joyful Palm Sunday to everyone. It's a, a great time of honoring Jesus. And this was a time of uh, people affirming him before a, a really uh, challenging, painful, uh, torturous week uh, coming up uh, in uh, Passion Week and Good Friday and, and uh, Holy Saturday and all those uh, other uh, very important days coming up. Um, but it's curious, uh, there's a convergence of holidays also uh, here. Um, you may remember that last Sunday was the first full day of spring. Uh, today is the first full day of uh, Passover. Um, some of our, our neighbors uh, celebrated uh, Annunciation Day on Thursday, and that's a that's a really a great holiday. So often uh, uh, forgotten, it's the day of celebrating the um, conception of Jesus in the womb of Mary, and it's exactly uh, nine months before Christmas. So we have these nine months to remember Jesus was in, in that year, the year of his birth was already uh, alive, already was the word that became flesh and uh, was uh, growing inside uh, Mary's womb. And of course, as all babies uh, gradually more and more attuned to uh, hearing the sounds and, and uh, around the voices, etc. cetera. So, uh, Jesus was a, a full human being, including the nine months of uh, time of gestation inside Mary. And that started uh, in that year, appropriately uh, lining up with last Thursday, just um, uh, uh, two or three days ago. And of course, with Palm Sunday, we introduce uh, Holy Week with uh, four uh, very important holidays in a row Thank the uh, uh, Monday, Thursday, celebrating the initiation of the Lord's Supper, celebrating uh, the, uh, you know, the time of Jesus' great teaching. About a third of the Gospel of John is the teaching of Jesus on Monday, Thursday. Very strong teaching on love, a very strong prayer of Jesus uh, on that Thursday evening. Uh, prayer for all of us, for unity, for um, loving and caring for one another in the way that the Father and the Son and Holy Spirit love each other. Great prayer in, in John 17. And the holiday, um, uh, such a transformative uh, holiday, Good Friday. Good, of course, because Jesus accomplished our salvation. He paid the price of of grace, of amazing grace that uh, forgives us, that liberates us. Holy Saturday in the patient of, uh, you know, waking um, people were eager to be able to go visit the grave to show their honoring of Jesus' body. And then of course, the most joyful holiday of all, uh, Resurrection Sunday, uh, starting off with uh, people going to the grave and realizing that the body was no longer there. And by the end of the day, Jesus visiting uh, different ones of his apostles, disciples, uh, special uh, appearance to uh, Mary Magdalene and so forth. So we're right in the time of a great celebration. And I'm thankful for this opportunity to uh, be with you and, and share from the scriptures the, what I think is crucial is seeing that what happened on Passion Week, what happened on Good Friday, what happened then on Resurrection Sunday, uh, all these things were part of Jesus' mission, a mission that uh, for many people in, in his own time, many people before him and since then, it says it's just improbable, if not impossible. So I thought it'd be helpful to look at the beginning of the gospel 
as we're at the beginning of Holy Week, Passion Week, and to remind ourselves of, of four of the uh, assignments, four of the aspects of Jesus' improbable mission, but in fact, historic mission and mission accomplished that uh, uh, Jesus did for all of us and for all people. And, and we're uh, eager to uh, share that accomplishment, that amazing good news uh, for everyone. Now, uh, what I thought I'd do is, is a look at these four missions of Jesus, four titles of Jesus, and uh, look at them, all of them mentioned in John chapter one. If you have your Bibles open, you could follow along with me and maybe take them in reverse order. Sometimes it's helpful to kind of awaken our senses, to see things. All of these stand, stand in a very important sense on their own. All of them are, are strong statements of God's mission for Jesus, God in Jesus, fulfilling a mission that is unlike any religious leader, unlike any uh, self-proclaimed helpful person or Messiah or, or uh, prophet, uh, Jesus as uh, unique on all these measures. The first one, if, if we are going backwards, so to speak, is uh, where Andrew tells uh, Peter that he is convinced that Jesus is the Messiah. Uh, when Andrew first uh, meets Jesus through the ministry of John the baptizer, Andrew uh, is uh, eager <laughs> then to tell his brother uh, the gospel. And I think that's awesome uh, to uh, reach out to family members. And of course the rest is history, Peter was a uh, very in, intensely important part of Jesus' inner circle, was a, a main speaker at the uh, Pentecost uh, birthing of the church, and uh, a, a man of extraordinary uh, leadership uh, once he was able to get over his egocentric issues uh, and, and to really be led by, uh, filled by, guided by uh, the Holy Spirit. So uh, in verses um, uh, 40 and 41 of John chapter one, it says, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two that had heard John uh, you know, say that Jesus was the lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world. And so Andrew finds his brother and tells him, quote, we have found the Messiah. And uh, so he brought Peter to Jesus. Now we think of Messiah as a very high calling, a, a very uh, positive statement, of course, uh, but yet there were prophecies in the Old Testament in the Hebrew scriptures that Messiah would die, uh, that, that there would be uh, uh, a rejection of the Messiah and, and that uh, uh, he would suffer. And uh, very pointedly, in the uh, book of Daniel, the prophet Daniel says that, that the, the Messiah will be put to death because people would reject him, reject his teaching, reject his ministry. As tragic as that sounded, even more tragically, that, uh, that prophecy, of course, was true. And we remember that especially on Holy Week, these, these days, these few days coming up uh, this week in, uh, as we run up to Resurrection Sunday. So the prophet Daniel in Daniel chapter nine, verses 25 and 26 prophesies the rejection and the, the murder of uh, the Messiah. <clears throat> Isaiah used the term a servant of God and holy one to reference Messiah. And uh, uh, for those, the servant of the Lord and the Holy One of the Lord, uh, those uh, prophecies in Isaiah also talk about his rejection. So Jesus is Messiah, improbable task. Uh, at the same time, 
uh, with, with great uh, suffering involved. And uh, Jesus accepted that. Jesus was in that role. <coughs> and Jesus is, uh, is the uh, one that achieved what was prophesied in the Old Testament and achieved that uh, salvation that he uh, purchased for us through his life and death and uh, resurrection. Now, another great theme in the uh, first chapter of uh, John's gospel is that Jesus is the son of God, uh, that uh, he, he really was this uh, amazing, the son of God. Now, there is a way in which we say that, that all people are children of God, so therefore daughters of God or sons of God, but to be the son of God, to be the, the perfect model, to be the, uh, the full representation of uh, who God is, as the scriptures teach us, there's only one who satisfies that standard, and uh, Jesus fulfilled that. Now, being so, the son of God, was uh, was a uh, point of derision, of uh, a term that was used to try to demean Jesus, laugh at Jesus. Uh, for example, uh, when uh, the the devil tried to tempt Jesus back in uh, Matthew chapter four, he said, "You know, if you are the Son of God." turn these stones into bread. Let's see you do a magic trick. Turn these stones into bread. But, you know, questioning, undermining, mocking what is, was nevertheless the true statement that he was the son of God. And then right away, uh, uh, the devil says, you know, if you are the son of God, why don't you just jump off this cliff jump off the uh, high place in the, this temple and just, just float down so everyone will realize that you can defy gravity and, uh, and they'll all uh, uh, honor you. And of course, that was not God's plan. God's plan was that Jesus would die for us, but in a particular time and a particular way, that he would be lifted up, he would be crucified, it was in the prophecies and that it would be on Passover. And uh, the devil was only trying to trip up Jesus. And thankfully, of course, unsuccessfully. People at the cross, people that came to watch the, the sight, they thought of a kind of entertainment, watching people die on crosses, uh, jeered, really mocked Jesus repeatedly. And, and said, uh, you know, if you are, if you are the uh, uh, son of God, uh, then, you know, just jump off the cross. If you are the son of God. And of course, Jesus is the son of God and is uh, not, uh, uh, was not uh, tempted at all uh, to stop his crucifixion, to uh, not finish the job he was sent to earth to do, um, and the uh, mocking didn't go anywhere. One of the most, if there is a positive thing, one of the most positive things is that at the cross, the centurion, who was a Roman soldier in charge of this horrific torture uh, before crucifying someone, and the torture of being on the cross, uh, he was in charge of that. He fulfilled what he was commanded to do by the governor, uh, Pilate. And, uh, and yet when he saw what happened, when he saw that uh, uh, when Jesus died, there was this earthquake and he, he saw uh, the uh, amazing way that Jesus forgave those that crucified him and, and his, his whole demeanor, his bringing salvation to uh, one of the others that was uh, crucified. The, the centurion said, when Jesus died, the centurion said, surely this man was the son of God. 
Uh, so even a pagan person recognized the amazing person of Jesus. And, and so way, way past the jeering of the, the hateful crowd. And of, and of course, as we know, it was even more dramatic than what the centurion saw at, at the uh, crucifixion because the, the, the veil, the big curtain in the temple that protected the Holy of Holies uh, tore to pieces um, when Jesus died. And very dramatically, Matthew and Mark record it tore from the top down, meaning God himself tore open the Holy of Holies so that's why you and I can, can approach the throne of mercy, can approach God's own uh, royal throne to seek grace and mercy in our time of need because the Holy of Holies is wide open. And all of us are commissioned, if we believe in God, if we receive his grace, we're commissioned to be priests. To, to pray for one another and, and to uh, represent God to one another, represent others to God in our prayers, our intercessory prayers, and represent God to others as we share our testimony, as we uh, share what we're learning as we're studying the scriptures and starting in our own families or neighbors or teams at work or, or friends among friends. You know, think of doing like a blast email uh, at least once a week to a group of friends, including non-believers, to encourage them with something that you've learned uh, during the week in studying the scriptures. But Jesus was the son of God. We want to know how to be more godly in our lives. We live by the teachings of Jesus. Another way to put it, is that uh, when you call yourself a Christian, I call myself a Christian, other people call us Christians, uh, take that as a high calling and a high compliment because the word Christian means uh, someone like Christ uh, or a little Christ. And while Christ is the only Messiah, Jesus Christ, the only Messiah, we can be more like him as we study his life in the scriptures and as we study his teachings and uh, share those with one another. So, so John shows these improbable missions of Jesus being Messiah and he achieved that in especially in what he did in, in that uh, what we now call Holy Week or Passion Week, including Good Friday, Holy Saturday and Resurrection Sunday. And he was the son of God. And he demonstrated that, especially even to the eyes of a pagan person uh, like the uh, centurion. Now, another title, another mission for Jesus in John 1 is to be uh, the lamb of God. And uh, that's repeated a couple of times. John the baptizer uh, uh, says, that he first uh, was introduced to uh, uh, who, who Jesus would be in terms of the spirit coming down on someone that he would baptize. And we know that they were cousins, maybe distant cousins. And sometimes people get tripped on that thinking, ah, one of the gospels says they're cousins, uh, Mary, Jesus' mother and Elizabeth, John the baptizer's mother, uh, were, were cousins so that therefore uh, Jesus and John were cousins. How, how did not John uh, recognize him just on that basis? But the fact is that even in our own lives with modern fast transportation and communication, uh, we can lose touch with our cousins. And uh, your person can, can be a cousin and you may not see them for years and years and years and they look different. Um, I had the experience of a little while ago going to a, a minister's conference saying to, to bring a message for a minister's conference and 
uh, a young man that seemed to be, you know, a, a leader among the ministers that were gathered together. I was very impressed with, and uh, people referenced him as Bruce, and so I, I uh, went up to him afterwards, and and he started the conversation as I was walking up to him. He says, "Hi, cuz," you know, "Hi, hi, cousin," and I, I said, "Really? Are we related?" He said, "Yes," and then he gave me his full name. Well, I. We were cousins, but I hadn't seen him. He's quite a bit younger than I, but I had not seen him since he was five years old. And now he was 45, I'm guessing. Uh, so it was a long time. And um, obviously he changed a lot. So the, my point is, uh, don't let people undermine your trust in the Bible. It is true. And um, John reported correctly, he needed to see uh, the one who uh, the spirit came down and, and landed on. And, he, and John had the eyes to see that and uh, saw that Jesus was the Lamb of God. <clears throat> now, what does that mean to be Lamb of God? There are many ways in which uh, Lamb of God concept is introduced in the Old Testament. One is where uh, in that um, kind of eerie story of Abraham and Isaac, and Abraham is confident that Isaac would, would not lose his life in this procedure that God had directed Abraham to do. Because Abraham said to his workers that he left at the bottom of the mountain, we will come back, meaning Isaac and Abraham. And the author of the book of Hebrews in chapter 11 says that Abraham was willing to go through all those steps in, in obedience to God because he knew that God would be able to even bring Isaac back to life. So Abraham is totally trusting God's goodness and that, that God would be protective of Isaac, this uh, wonderful uh, miracle child. Uh, but when, when uh, God stopped Abraham from offering Isaac as a sacrifice, uh, you know, the Abraham looked up and there was a lamb. In fact, God had guided Abraham uh, to believe that God himself would provide the lamb and there's some ambiguity whether God was the lamb or God would provide the lamb or God provide the lamb in that incident and God himself is the lamb in the story of uh, Jesus. He is the lamb of God. And then Passover lamb, uh, out of uh, belief in God, the way you, the, the people of Israel as slaves, who had been slaves for a long time, uh, showed their trust in God and, and, and therefore that the death angel would not touch anyone in their home. Uh, that was shown by uh, sacrificing an animal right in front of their house, right at their uh, uh, front door and then putting the uh, blood on either side and above and, and in the walk the threshold of the door, really symbolizing the cross already back uh, 1,500 years before Jesus was born. Uh, and these were uh, lambs of God that were uh, a sign of people's trust in God. And uh, the messianic lamb in Isaiah 53, uh, the lamb that would be uh, slaughtered for all of us. And, and would provide redemption for everyone. Uh, prophesied 700 years before Jesus was born in Isaiah 53, this amazing miracle lamb of God. And even later when uh, John, the apostle John who wrote the gospel according to John, when he has this vision of heaven, uh, there is this exciting moment where uh, heaven is, crying out for someone who's worthy to open up the seals of a special scroll that had prophecies in it, had, had judgments of the Lord in it. And uh, everyone says, no, the lion of, lion of Judah, he's the one. 
And when uh, John looks up, the, the Lion of Judah turns out to be the lamb that was slain and lives forevermore. And the, that reference to Jesus as the lamb who is slain and lives forevermore, that uh, comes uh, two or three times later also in the book of Revelation. Another kind of a, a great e event that's part of that is when people say, and and in the prophecies it talked about that in the messianic time that the lions and lambs could actually lay down together without the lion eating the lamb. And of course, they are together in the book of Revelation because the lion of the book of Revelation is the lamb. Uh, Jesus embodies all the, the positive characteristics of courage and leadership and uh, strength of a lion at the same time, the, uh, the uh, beautiful innocence, the beautiful uh, uh, joyful offering of, uh, of, of blood salvation uh, that the lamb represents to us as well. So Jesus is the lamb of God in, in our list. First of all, Messiah, well, Messiah had to die according to uh, the prophets in the Old Testament. Jesus as the son of God. So that was a point of derision by uh, the devil and, and by the mockers uh, poking fun of Jesus while he was suffering for their sin. And he is the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And one other, probably the most extraordinary mission for Jesus that's uh, outlined in uh, John chapter one is that Jesus is the word that became flesh. So there's this uh, great introduction there in the first few verses of uh, Gospel according to John about the word of God um, as, as right from the beginning, part of creation. Of course, we know that because the Bible teaches that God just spoke things into existence. Let there be light. And there was light. So right in the beginning of Genesis, we have the Trinity because in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, represents especially the Father's work. Um, this In chapter 1, verse 2, the Spirit of God hovered over the earth, kind of warming the earth, preparing the earth, not like a, a hen hovering over uh, eggs and the and then in verse three, uh, God said, "Let there be light," and there was light. And of course, Jesus is the model of light too. And in His light, there is life. Uh, John says in the beginning of that gospel. Well, the strong sense of the word uh, that unites everything was a, around. People had talked about this before, um, even great philosophers of, of other uh, countries had talked about uh, the word as, as just uh, what holds the world together, as like the cosmic glue for everything. Um, Heraclitus, you may have heard of, was an ancient uh, European philosopher who uh, was uh, you know, a couple hundred years before Socrates. And he was a brilliant guy, but he was observing that things constantly change. You can't step into the same river twice because even by stepping in, you stir up the plants or uh, stir up the sand at the bottom of the river or whatever. You can, and the river is constantly flowing. So new things, new, new colors, new animals in the river constantly. Uh, and life is like a river, you know, constant change, constant flux. But, but then Heraclitus said, however, below all the change, below kind of a giving sense to it all is, is the logos, is the word, um, you know, is, is some kind of a deep logic to uh, the world that he called the logos, which is what John calls Jesus too in, in John chapter one. Um, but what Heraclitus never said was that the word became flesh. 
became a human being and moved in to the neighborhood. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the son, the, the, the only begotten of the father, the son of God. The uh, amazing, unique role of Jesus is the word that became flesh. Now, in some sense, word should always be flesh. There's always a, a difference, tragically, there's always a difference between the ought and the is, <laughs> what we know we ought to do, uh, our, what we actually do very often uh, doesn't, at least doesn't perfectly represent the ought, the, the way the word teaches us. So that the, uh, the idea of the word becoming flesh is the ultimate, ultimate communication, the ultimate integrity where the word of God becomes also flesh to be lived out in a human lifetime, you know, starting with, starting with the uh, conception of Jesus in Mary on, on that approximately March 25, using our calendar, uh, nine months before uh, December 25. Now, Repeatedly, uh, world religions have denied these very claims of uh, who Jesus is, have denied that, that one person could fully represent the role of uh, son of God, to be the son of God, uh, deny that someone could actually die for other people's sins. They were just mocked by the Muslims to, but because we believe that. Uh, and yet, uh, that was the prophecy in the Old Testament hundreds of years before Jesus. And Jesus himself affirmed that. Jesus, the uniquely perfect uh, uh, model uh, human being, uh, repeatedly made that claim that, that uh, he would die for us. And, and then to be the word that became flesh. In, in, for so many people, that idea... Of, of the, the infinite divine uh, becoming an infant, the word becoming flesh is, is a paradox that just boggles their minds. And yet it is true, it happened. And Jesus faced the improbable mission, mission improbable and was a, a total success on all these four. He is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world by dying for our sins. He is the Word, the divine Word that became flesh and dwells among us. As hard as these are to understand, look at Jesus' life, look toward Jesus and realize he achieved it he is a success. He is the amazing success. Now, I think paradox is always deep and we shouldn't just blow them off. In fact, a lot of great truths are said in paradox. Uh, I encourage you to look at uh, the website xparadox.com, x for Christ, because the first letter in the uh, name Christ, it, it looks like an x, like a an English X. So xparadox.com. I have about 30 paradoxes, one for each of the main disciplines of a college or university, and, uh, and uh, three or four of them from the scriptures. So please uh, take a look. Uh, it it's, doesn't count against a truth that it's a paradox. The paradox of a man being the Lamb of God. The paradox of uh, the word, the infinite divine word becoming flesh and moving into earth, be joining the neighborhood, dwelling among us and continuing to, because he is Emmanuel, he is God with us. Uh, so these wonderful paradoxes are great uh, containers of truth and uh, these should not challenge us, but help us to realize that God's way of doing something 
is always above our own finite mind's ability to, to really fully understand or grasp. And that's why we trust God and trust his grace. So be encouraged. Jesus, Jesus achieved where the world says it was impossible. He is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He is the divine, infinite word that became flesh and dwelt among us. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for the amazing teaching of John 1 that prepare us so well to understand, to affirm, to deeply celebrate uh, all that you accomplished, Lord Jesus, in Holy Week uh, two centuries ago. And, and may we celebrate in a deep way, deeper than ever before, the amazing gift of your grace paid for, made possible through all that you did in Holy Week and Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday. In Jesus' precious name, we pray. Hallelujah and amen.